in chapter 22. We're cruising right along at a chapter a, a week. And so uh, maybe next week we'll try to hit a whole chapter then too. But uh, yeah, if you'd open up your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 22. And before we get started and before the people in the back do their little dance, let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Uh, thank you for just a sweet time of worship, Lord, for a chance to get together with our brothers and sisters and to lift one another up, Father, to truly put you first, Lord, to just be reminded, Father, of who you are and uh, just to sit and worship you, Father. So I thank you for tonight, Lord. I pray that you go before this, this study, Lord, in your word, that you would open, uh, open it up to us, Father, that you would just reveal your heart to us, Lord, that you would show us your patience and your long suffering, that you would just uh, continue to reveal yourself in a fresh new way to us, Lord. I pray that you go before uh, the message tonight, Lord, that you would just anoint it, that you would light it on fire, Father, that it would do its work in our lives, Lord. We know that your word doesn't go out void, Father, that it will do the purpose that you've designed it for, Lord. So we pray that you would do a work in us, Father, in us personally, Lord, tonight. So just go before it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in Ezekiel chapter 22, and I had shared with you that Ezekiel is in captivity. He's in Babylon and he has been given a message from the Lord for the people that are in captivity and for those that are still in the land of Jerusalem. See, Ezekiel has his own home. He's married, so life really isn't that terrible for him. But this is not where he's supposed to be. He and all the people are supposed to be in the land of Israel. But they have lost the battles with the nations around and have been removed from the land. See, these are still God's people, and normally he would fight the battles with them or even for them, but he has stopped doing that because the people have left him in their hearts. They have instead turned again to following idols. They sacrificed their children in the fire to these guys. They also have turned against their own people and all the others in the land with them. See, their sin has become so great that the Lord cannot let them continue like this. He has warned them. He has sent prophets to tell them. He's told them what's going to happen, and he has given them opportunity after opportunity to turn, to repent, to stop this judgment that is coming. But judgment is coming. They don't want to repent, and the judgment won't be stopped. See, I've picked up from chapter 18 of Ezekiel, and I... Uh, since that time, I don't remember one time where the Lord has said, if you will do this, I will not judge you. It's, it's going to happen. He hasn't said, I will stop the armies from coming against you. See, not only has God not helped them fight off the enemy, he has actually been helping the enemy take them into captivity. Last week, God spoke to Ezekiel, and he told him to prophesy against Israel and against the city of Jerusalem. God has prepared his own sword. He sharpened it. He's polished it. And he gave it to Nebuchadnezzar to use against his very own people. Then he is going to let the king of Babylon use it also against the Ammonites. See, God is not bringing judgment on them because he is angry, but because they've disobeyed. And like a good parent, you don't just go into the room, spank the child, and walk out. There is a reason behind the punishment. Tonight, we start off with another message from the Lord to Ezekiel. He says, tell the people of Jerusalem why I'm bringing judgment on them. So Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 1 says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. So twice in this verse alone, he's told to judge the city. Judge them or pass on God's judgment to them. Tell her of all the wicked things that she's done. See, this city has really become a bloody city. Then say, thus says the Lord God, the city sheds blood in her own midst, that her time may come and she makes idols within herself to defile herself. 
See, these wicked acts happened not only outside the city, but inside the city walls. This evil was not just in the surrounding areas, in the trees and in the high places. Remember, he called them Bama. Well, Bama, or these places of worship, have come into the city of God, into their own homes. The idol worship was happening right in front of the temple, even inside the temple, and in front of the people. The sin is what is causing the judgment of God to come to the city. Involved in the worship of these idols was human sacrifice. Nowhere in the Bible has God asked to be worshipped with human sacrifice. Yet his own people are sacrificing to idols they have created, thinking it will make these carvings happy, and in turn, they'll be blessed. When the truth is, God said, obey me, and I will bless you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set your high above all nations on the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. See, instead of God's people serving him in the city that bears his name, they left him and defiled the city and themselves with their sin. They gave it the name, the bloody city. It was God's people that spilled the blood, and there was no concern as to where this happened because they did not fear God. He says, you have become guilty by the blood which you have shed and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near and have come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all the countries. Those near and those far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. See, the blood has made you guilty. The death of innocent cries out to the Lord through the blood. When Cain killed his brother, his innocent blood cried out to God in Genesis chapter 4. See, they are guilty before God. They are the cause of the judgment God is bringing against them. And the message was, you caused this judgment to come. See, God is not just looking for people to judge. He wants to extend his mercy, his grace, but he can't let this sin continue on. It is like cancer and has to be stopped before it completely destroys the body. And because of their sin, God has made them a mockery to other nations. If to be called a Gentile dog was bad or a Samaritan, to the other nations around, no one would want to be called a Jew. That would be an insult. God puts up with a lot from his creation, but there has to be a time when his patience runs out and correction begins. For the Jew, that time has come. It appears that the death of the innocent was the last straw for God. That is not the only thing they'd done. See, Ezekiel's list in the next few verses, more of their sins and the reason God was judging the nation and Jerusalem in particular. He says in verse 6, Look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you they have made light of father and mother. In your midst they have oppressed the stranger. In you... They have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. See, Ezekiel points out that the leaders are responsible for these evil practices, just like the people are. They have not led the people back to what is right, but are involved in the exact same thing that the people are doing. See, the king was supposed to judge the people and go out and fight the battles for them. See, in 1 Samuel... When the people really wanted a king, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And they got what they asked for. Instead of being governed by God, they were ruled by a king, and their kings had led them away from God, just like all the nations around them. They used their position to take advantage of the people, to make laws that went against what God had already told them. These princes have led the people into even more idol worship. Ezekiel goes on reminding them or judging them of all their wickedness. He says in verse 8, 
You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst they commit lewdness. In you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. And another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you they take bribes to shed blood. You take usury and increase. You have made profit from your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord. See, in this list... First off, we see that there was no concern for the holy things of God. They could care less about the Sabbath or honoring the Lord. Second, they had no concern for others. They told lies about others to cause their death. Their love for family and respect for parents is gone. Sexual sin everywhere, even in the family. To break these verses down and examine each one is not something we're going to do tonight. What they were doing was just sick and wrong like Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot of this list is sexual, but there's also the mistreatment of others, making a profit at someone else's expense. See, God has given them his law, but even in this they disobeyed. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19, you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. Even down to the smallest detail, they were disobeying God. He wants to be honored by his people and finishes this list by saying, you have forgotten me. The very nation and city that bears his name have forgotten him. This list could be said of America. See, we're doing the same things. We pass laws so that we can continue to sin against the Lord. And I believe God is not happy with America's sin either. Just like with his own people especially if we started out as a nation calling on his name. It says, Behold, therefore I beat my fist at the dishonest profit which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Now, I was interested in this verse. See, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And if God is spirit... Does he have fists? See, God is always trying to relate to us, make it as simple as possible for us to know him. The sin that is going on has angered God. He very easily could have said, I am so frustrated, I took the moon and smashed it into a black hole on the other side of the universe. But he didn't. See, we know what it feels like to be angry and slam the door and yell at the top of our lungs. God says, I'm angry. And what is going on? And I beat my fist together in frustration. Then he goes on and he says, can your heart endure or can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. Again, still no letting up, no turning, no relenting of this judgment that's coming. See, the Lord is not trying to be a monster and scare us though, but fear is a good teacher. He has tried to warn them, but they have not listened. Now he is going to come against them, and when he does, everyone will faint. God loves us like a father, but he is still God, and when he allows his wrath to be seen, everyone will be afraid. Exodus 20, interesting set of verses, it says, Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. See, when God came and descended on the mountain, it was a scary thing. Moses said, Don't be afraid of God, but do be afraid of disobeying him. Now we see the people have disobeyed God, and it is not saying, Don't fear but you will melt at my coming. Your knees will buckle under you. I will scatter you among the nations, he goes on and says. Disperse you throughout the countries and remove your filthiness completely from you. 
you shall defile yourself in the sight of the nations. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord, just like in the last chapter, is going to send them into captivity. Not only is God dealing with the nation as a whole and the rulers of the nation, God is also focusing on the city of Jerusalem. The people and the rulers in his city, the place where he chose to put his temple, God says to them through Ezekiel, I will scatter you. Do you see that God did not say, I am going to destroy you completely, but scatter you? If I was God, I think I would say, I'm going to destroy you, but I'm not God. And instead of saying destroy, he says, I'm going to scatter you. God, even in his anger, is going to care for them. He is going to remove their sin from them, and then he will bring them back. Remember, just two chapters earlier in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37, God said, He will bring them back and they will pass under his rod. And the unrighteousness will not come back into the land from captivity. Not only will they know that he is God when he kicks them out of his land, but they will know when he brings them back again. God's anger may be poured out, but even while all this is going on, God is still caring for those who are truly his. Verse 17, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. They are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead. In the midst of a furnace, they have become dross from silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. So God continues to speak to Ezekiel, and he says, I'm going to judge all of Israel. And what he does is gather the people left in the nation into the heart of Jerusalem, behind the walls. It is like the furnace, because they all gather behind these walls of the city in hopes of fighting off the enemy. But then the Babylonians come, and they surround the city, and they trap them inside. False prophets had said the Lord wouldn't let the city be taken, but God uses the enemy to stoke the fire, to test his people. Last week, I told you that some of the people surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar. The rest stayed inside the city and tried to wait out the enemy, hoping they would be called away or give up. We know that they were starving inside the city when they finally broke through the wall. God was the one behind this attack, and when he tried the people and tests them, all he finds is dross. Dross is garbage. It's the dirt, it's the stuff that floats to the surface. He has heated up the furnace, but inside, where he wants to find the silver, all he finds is garbage. Worthless material, not what he was looking for. As men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yes, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst. As silver is melted in the midst of a furnace, so shall you be melted in its midst. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. See, God wants the people to know that he is the one who is against them. He's not trying to hide this. He wants them to know that he's bringing the judgment. And that's why he's given this message to Ezekiel in advance. See, all this stuff hasn't happened yet. This is beforehand. He's warning us beforehand of something that will come, of judgment that will come. And they could either heed the warning or not. And like I said, some have already given up and surrendered. And that's what God told them to do, but some have not. Isaiah 1 uh, verse 25 says, I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness. The faithful city, Zion, shall be redeemed with justice and her penitence with righteousness. See, in the testing, all the garbage is removed. If there's anything of value, he will save it. Looking at this verse, it seems hopeless. See, God has already said they're all dross, right? There is none righteous, no, not one. But our God knows the beginning from the end. He sees the both the beginning and the end of our life. 
He knows who will choose him in the testing of his people that may be dross now, but only he knows if there is silver left. You know, I don't know what my life would have turned out like. Looking from the outside, it was all going downhill. But God saw something in the future. You know, so these people that he's judging, he's looking for silver. And it's not like he's just looking for the current. How will their hearts change? He's looking for that silver. He's looking for any ray of hope. Any bit that he can find, he's going to save. We don't know what God is doing, but we do know that whatever he is doing, it is for our good. It may not be easy now, but this trial or this fire that is getting hotter is going to remove the garbage and make him visible in our lives. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. See, God's great purpose in this coming judgment and exile was to spiritually and morally cleanse the land. In Leviticus 26, verse 4, rain is promised for the land if Israel will obey God. The land is in an area that is plagued with drought, but the blessing of rain is conditional. If the people will obey God, then just like he rained down manna in the wilderness, he will also cause the rain to come in a drought-stricken land, which is a miracle. He will bring the rain, but if they will not, he will not bring the rain, and both them and the land will suffer. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, it says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So, so far, we know that the people are involved in idol worship. There's all kinds of other sins that they're currently doing and going through. In the very city of God, they're doing all of these sins. But is there a drought going on in the land? Is God currently holding back the rain? Well, Jeremiah and Ezekiel were both prophets around the same time. Ezekiel in Babylon and Jeremiah is actually in Jerusalem. And in Jeremiah chapter 5, it says, in verse 23, but this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. So in Jeremiah 5, we're told that their sins have stopped the rain. In Jeremiah chapter 14, it says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns and her gates languish. They mourn for the land and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads because the ground is parched for there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. See, God had withheld the rain. The land was dry, and this was to be a sign to the people. See, God has done all he said he would do to turn them around, to send the prophet to warn them, but there was no turning for these guys. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. So God's been giving Ezekiel these messages over and over again, telling him what he wants him to say. And he has a message for these prophets. They have gotten together and they've plotted against the people and are tearing them apart like a lion and his prey. See, these prophets are not speaking for God. Jeremiah, who was given the message of God, will be thrown into prison for standing up for the Lord. The very ones that are supposed to teach his law are the ones violating the holy things of God and the Sabbath. They should have been teaching, teaching the people what is holy and what is not, 
what is clean and what is not, how to follow him, but instead they've led the rebellion against the Lord. This is not the first time Ezekiel has had a message for these prophets. He says in Ezekiel 13, O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the desert. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of the Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. They have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Lord, but the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. Have you not seen a futile vision? And have you not spoken false divination? You say, the Lord says, but I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am a deed against you, says the Lord God. So these people, these priests, these prophets that were supposed to be standing up for the Lord, they're actually causing people to profane the name of the Lord. The, war, the ones that claim to represent God are the very ones that are going to suffer these consequences. He says in verse 27, her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. So God even has a message for the rulers who are like wild animals, tearing apart prey. The people are being attacked by those who are supposed to be caring for them. See, the princes and the prophets are backing each other up and they're getting wealthy by taking advantage of the people of Israel. And they don't care who they destroy to get at their wealth. Her prophets plaster them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they have wrongly oppressed the stranger. See, these prophets are a piece of work. They profess to be speaking for the Lord, but it says that they divine lies. And remember last week when I was talking to you about Nebuchadnezzar and how he's going to decide which road to take, and he takes the liver and he looks at it, or he throws the arrows down and he's trying to figure out which way he's going to go. These prophets are doing the exact same thing. They're trying to figure out what God's doing by looking at the liver or shaking out the arrows or however they're trying to figure out how to speak for God. But at the same time that they're using these divinations, they're claiming to speak for the Lord. He says, these prophets are compared to untempered mortar. It is the, like mud without strength or like a whitewash slurry they coat over things with. And instead of warning the people of the danger coming and pointing them to serve the Lord, they are giving the people false hope. They cover over the problem with this whitewash, declaring everything will be okay, saying that they have a message from the Lord when God has not spoken. They tell the people the enemy is not going to take the city and that God will not allow that to happen. Just like a wall that has no support are these messages that God did not give. It is not just the prophets and the rulers that are using those under them to benefit themselves. Even the people of the land are involved in this as well. It's a trickle-down effect. Everyone attacking and using those who are beneath them, taking advantage of someone else, the poor, the needy, the stranger in the land, are being mistreated and robbed. They are the ones that should have been protected. Those who are supposed to protect and shepherd the people of God are the ones attacking and devouring. What a great example of God they are. The nation of Israel, where he chose to dwell. It is here that God's people have taken advantage of others. And by doing so, they're slandering the name of the Lord. He says in verse 30, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it but I found no one God's answer to all this sin to what he sees going on in Israel and in Jerusalem is to look for a man a leader someone who can stand in the gap before God and the people but he didn't find one Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1 Jeremiah was told to run back and forth, looking for a just man. And if Jeremiah was able to find just one righteous man, God would not judge the city. Here, 
Ezekiel is told that God has looked for one man to make a wall, someone who will stand up for what is right, someone who will stand in the gap. To stand in the gap, a person must be a man of prayer, lifting the people up to the Lord. If that person could be found, God would not destroy the city. The sad part is that God says he found no one. And verse 31 says, Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. See, in verse 30, God speaks of himself looking for a reason not to destroy the city. Now three times he speaks of what will happen even though it has not yet. I have poured out my anger on them. I have consumed them. I have given them what they earned. There was no one to stop God's wrath from being poured out on the people. God was looking for someone who could stop the wrath of God with a wall. Not a weak wall, whitewashed to look strong. Someone who could make a strong wall, able to take the wrath of God and protect the people behind it. Someone who is given to prayer, standing in the gap like Moses when the people made idols and forgot God. Psalm says in 106 verse 23, so he declared he would destroy them, but Moses, his chosen one, stepped between the Lord and the people. He begged him to turn from his anger and not destroy them. We know, ultimately, God never found a man who could do this. Instead, he became a man. He sent his son who went to the cross and took the wrath of God for my sins, took them on himself. He became a wall between me and God he took the judgment I deserved and died a sinner's death on a cross. But that wall remains for all who want to believe in Jesus and get behind it. He is not dead, but he is still standing in the gap. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 23 says, There were many priests under the old system, and death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. See, I don't know who's here. I don't know who's out there watching this message. I don't know who believes in Christ and who doesn't. But I do know that Jesus Christ loves you and will save you if you will just believe in him. God has done all the work to make it as simple as possible. Romans chapter 10 verse 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And in verse 13 it says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For those of you who may be watching this, who may be tuning in for the first time, if you would like to have Jesus stand in the gap for you, will you pray with me? We're gonna close in prayer. Father, thank you for your message tonight, Lord. A lot of judgment and a lot of correction needed but we call on your name, Father. Father, for those who are out there who don't believe in you, Lord, who would love to have you to stand for them, Father, to stand in the gap, Father, I pray that you'd help them just to pray with me, Father. We know that you died for us. We know that you gave your life for us, Father. And I want you as my Lord. I want you as my Savior. I believe you are alive today. And I thank you for the work that you did on the cross to save me from my sin. I thank you for standing in that gap for me, for taking the wrath and the judgment that I so deserved on yourself and dying for me so that I could have a relationship with you. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for your message tonight, Lord. I pray that you continue to speak to us, Father. Continue to give us a heart for you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.